Hi, we are just getting ready to broadcast. We are two minutes out and we will be with you shortly. Hello everyone and welcome to Holiday Tales. We are coming to you live from Webster's Bookstore Cafe. In a few minutes, you'll get to meet the owner of Webster's. We'll get her up here to say hi. But our first reader is our very, very special guest, County Commissioner Mark Higgins. So let's bring Mark into the broadcast. Hi, Cynthia. And Mark, can you turn your mic on? Is his mic on? The mic's on at my end. You can hear him? All right. Mark, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks, Cynthia. I'm uh, Center County Commissioner Mark Higgins, and I will be reading The Snowy Day, written and illustrated by Ezra Jack Keats. Since it was published in 1962, this book has been checked out of the New York Public Library system more than any other book, more than a half million times. So there's the hero of our story walking in the snow. There's snow. There he is sliding. I yeah, hope everybody can see that. One winter morning, Peter woke up and looked out the window. Snow had fallen during the night. It covered everything as far as he could see. At breakfast, he put on his snowsuit and ran outside. The snow was piled up very high along the street to make a path for walking. Crunch, crunch, crunch. His feet sank in the snow. He walked with his toes pointed out like this. Right here. He walked with his toes pointed in like that. There we go. Then he dragged his feet slowly to make traps and he found something sticking out of the snow that made a new track. It was a stick, a stick that was just right for smacking a snow covered tree. Down fell the snow plop on top of Peter's head. He thought it would be fun to join the big boys in their first in their snowball fight, but he knew he wasn't old enough, not yet. So he made a smiling snowman. He made angels. 
he pretended he was a mountain climber. He climbed up a great big tall heaping mountain of snow and slid all the way down. He picked up a handful of snow and another and still another. He packed it round and firm and put the snowball in his pocket for tomorrow. Then he went into his warm house. He told his mother all about his adventures while she took off his wet socks. And he thought and thought and thought about them. I think he's thinking about his adventures and not his wet socks. Before he got into bed, he looked in his pocket. His pocket was empty. The snowball wasn't there. He felt very sad. While he slept, he dreamed that the sun had melted all the snow away. But when he woke up, his dream was gone. The snow was still there. New snow was falling. After breakfast, he called to his friend across the hall and they went out together into the deep, deep snow. The end. Thank you for allowing me to read one of my favorite children's stories and one of the favorite children's stories in actually the favorite children's story in New York City, The Snowy Day by Ezra Jack Keats. Now I'll hand it back to uh, Cynthia. Thank you, Mark. Oh, you're welcome. Bye everyone. And Steph, want to take him? Well, there we go. <laughs> so as we get started this evening, and County Commissioner Mark Higgins just read us a lovely, lovely book about snow, right? And the things we get to do in the snow. Tonight, we'll be looking at several board books or shorter books this morning and stories for our very, very young readers. And then we're going to move into our theater for young audiences, young readers and families, and then eventually end later this evening with Truman Capote's A Christmas Memory at nine o'clock. We are live from Webster's Bookstore Cafe from 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. tonight. I have a riddle for you. So if you are out there, put the answer in Facebook if you can. Which one of Santa's reindeer is the fastest? Anybody? We'll give them a few seconds. If anybody's out there on Facebook watching and they can put that in for us. Anybody in my studio audience here have an answer? Oh, uh, Frosty and Snowball. It's a yeah. good, Dasher. good Dasher. choice. Dasher, Josephine Perone got it. Ding, ding, ding. It is Dasher if you're out there. When does Christmas come after Thanksgiving? Oh no, I have that wrong. When does Christmas come before Thanksgiving? Do, 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 do. Hey, and if you haven't caught Hester Blum on Jeopardy, you want to watch those reruns too. Anybody got it? When does Christmas come before Thanksgiving? In the dictionary. In the dictionary. Woo! All right. <laughs> Who is the most impolite and disrespectful of all the reindeer? Elizabeth Bagley's over here on my right. She's thinking, she's going through all the reindeer. Everybody out there, are you marking the reindeer? Rude off. Oh, Get it? Wow. <laughs> all right, and on that note, there'll be more riddles to come, but I am gonna turn this over to Elizabeth. There we go. Hello, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Bagley. I'm actually a student at Penn State. Um, I'm a part of Tempest Productions, and tonight I will be reading The Christmas Parade by Sandra Boyton. Boom, biddy, boom, biddy, boom, boom, boom. Biddy, boom, biddy, boom, biddy, boom, boom, boom. What is that noise filling the room? I think that's the sound of the Christmas parade. Run to the window, open the shade. Yes! 
first comes the elephant marching along with a boom bitty boom bitty steady and strong. And next come the chickens with silver bassoons. Followed by piggies with Christmas balloons. Oh look, drumming hippos with a rat-a-tat-tat. -tat. And even more hippos and one drummer cat. The Christmas parade with holly confetti. The Christmas parade, here comes more. Are you ready? One Santa Claus rhino, two cow saxophones, three piccolo mice, four ducks with trombones, womp womp. And now last of all comes the tiniest bird with the noisiest tuba you have ever heard. The parade is now over, it's starting to snow. And then ding dong, knock knock, is it someone we know? Rush to the door, open it wide, look who it is standing outside. We thank you for watching, our time here is through. We just want to say Merry Christmas to you. The band has gone home now, you're snug in your room, and dreaming of things that go boom biddy boom. Good night, sleep tight. Christmas Parade by Sandra Boyton. Hi, I'm Jim Colbert. I'm gonna be reading Fritz, The Farting Reindeer by Humor Heals Us. Everyone was so excited that Christmas was just one week away. Santa came to visit and say hi to all his reindeer. Be sure to hydrate and drink a lot of water before the big day. Every year, Santa chose his best reindeer to assist him. The task was huge. Deliver Christmas presents around the world to little boys and girls to make sure that his reindeer were up to the task, only the best were chosen. Reindeer who wanted to be on Santa's Christmas crew had to perform a series of tests. No one really knew how Santa chose his reindeer, but one thing was for sure. He picked only the ones he knew would endure the long and difficult journey. Since Comet was out with a broken leg and Cupid was away on a special mission, there were spots up for grab. Fritz couldn't believe it. The day was fast approaching. He had waited all year for it. This meant he needed to make final preparations. Would he be one of the reindeer chosen? On Monday, he ran the five miles assigned. But while he was running, he got that oh so familiar feeling in his tummy. Oh no, not now, not today. Santa is watching. Can you come back later, Gas? He intentionally ran slower. But with every step he took, the air escaped like the slow release of a balloon. <clears throat> On Tuesday, safety class started at 8 a.m. During the instruction, Fritz let out a silent fart. He thought, what's the harm? But then everyone started making faces. He joined in so no one would suspect him. What in the world is that smell? Oh, did someone have beans for lunch? On Wednesday, Fritz was feeling good about his chances of being chosen, but then a disaster happened. After practice, everyone went down to the pond to swim. He thought he was safe to release gas. Suddenly bubbles began to appear. He tried to cover it up, but there were just too many. Everyone looked at him in disbelief. Oh. 
on Thursday. All the reindeer gathered around for their weekly comedy skit. Rudolph was telling the best jokes and everyone was having a grand time. Then Rudolph delivered his last punchline and it sent Fritz rolling. He accidentally let some farts escape. He felt awkward, so he laughed it off. Santa was there again. Hope he doesn't smell it, Fritz thought. On Friday, burritos were served for lunch. Oh, goody, my favorite. After he had three burritos, he felt a loud scream coming from his tummy. He ran to the bathroom before it could escape. In that glorious moment when he could fart loud and proud, he got a feeling of satisfaction and accomplishment. I made it. <laughs> On Saturday, everyone gathered around to get their antlers polished. Fritz was third in line when suddenly he got that airy feeling again. Boy, do I need to let one rip, he thought. So that's exactly what he did. As soon as the others noticed the smell, he looked up at the sky, pretending to see something very unusual. No one even expected it was him. Did you see that cloud that's shaped like a clown? No, I didn't. Finally, it was the big day. Santa would announce which reindeer would accompany him this year. As he called the names, Fritz felt, Fritz felt sure that he would not be chosen. He began to look down at the floor. Dasher, Prancer, Vixen. And Fritz. What did he say? Fritz, that's me. I'm Fritz. Fritz was so overcome with joy to be a part of Santa's Christmas crew, and he was so thankful that it hadn't mattered that he had a lot of gas. For the sake of all the other reindeer, let's put you in the back, Fritz. The end. This is Fritz the Farting Reindeer by Humor Heals Us. Humor does heal us. Thank you. Hi, sorry about that. My name is Josephine Perone, and today I'd like to read to you a book that's called Nutcracker Night, and it was written by Marielle Messier, and the beautiful paintings, the illustrations were done by Gabrielle Grimard. I need to tell you a little bit about this, please. The Nutcracker Night is based on the ballet, The Nutcracker Suite, and you may have seen that or maybe even danced in it. The first time this ballet was presented, uh, it was written by Pyotr Ilyich Chaskayevsky, and it was in 1892. That was 130 years ago. And every year, every December, hundreds of productions of the Nutcracker Suite take place all around the world. Now, here's the story. Marie, also known as Clara, and Fritz's parents are having a fancy party on Christmas Eve. The children's godfather invites arrives with special gifts, a toy for Fritz and a wonderful Nutcracker soldier doll for Marie. Fritz is jealous and breaks Marie's doll. The godfather fixes the doll with his handkerchief, but Marie is still worried about her Nutcracker. After the party ends and everyone goes to sleep, Marie steals back downstairs and falls asleep next to her beloved doll. In Marie's dream, the Christmas tree magically grows. The Nutcracker comes to life and becomes the Nutcracker Prince. 
toy soldiers become his his army as he battles the mouse king and his army of mice after the mouse king is vanquished the prince takes marie to the land of the sweets where whimsical creatures and characters dance for them when she wakes marie is at the foot of the christmas tree was it really a dream nutcracker night can see here the little girl and his father her father are going to catch the taxi to go to see the ballet Swish, go the cars beep beep goes our taxi Swish, goes the fancy fountain swish swish goes my frilly dress clip clop clip clop go daddy's new shoes Chitter, chatter, chatter, chitter, go the crowd. Tickets, please, says the usher. Pickle ding, zing, boom. Ding goes the orchestra as it tunes up. Clap, 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 goes the audience. There's all the children. Tick, 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 goes the conductor. Shh, go the parents. Go the red velvet curtains. Oh, wow. Crinkle, crinkle goes the tissue paper. Stomp, stomp goes the boy. Snap goes the doll. Goes the girl. Trick, trick goes the head as Godfather fixes the doll. Bong, 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 bong. <gasps> grr, 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 growls the, growls the mouse king. Shrap, 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 go the toy soldiers. Oh, yay! Click, go the lights. It's intermission. <laughs> Fizz, clink, crunch. Ding, 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 goes the bell. <laughs> goes the man in the red shirt. Taka, 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 goes the sugar plum fairy. Zumbando go the flamenco dancers. Shuffle, 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 jingle, jangle go the polonchnelas. Those are the little clowns. Bravo, brava goes the crowd. Did you enjoy the ballet? asks my dad. Goes my kiss. Nutcracker night. Hello, everybody. I'm Lori, and I'm going to be reading The Little Black Cat, a folktale from France. This tale takes place on the day of St. Sylvester, 31st of December. Many European countries celebrate this day with traditional customs. In some Alpine villages, masked figures known as Sylvester Schlausen go from house to house dressed in elaborate costumes of greenery. They ring giant bells and sing yodeling songs to wish people a happy new year. In many places in Europe, it is still popular to go to a rural spot for one's health, like the friends in the story. It was the last day of December. In a village at the foot of an Alpine pass in one wooden house, a fat tabby cat stretched on the hearth rug, warming his fur in the firelight. In another, a couple clinked their glasses and cut themselves a slice of chocolate chestnut log, whilst a ginger tomcat lapped from a saucer. Next door, a kitten played, pawing the decorations hanging from the tree. 
But outside the wind howled and the last brown leaves rattled and shivered on the trees. The rain lashed in slanting sheets, hissing on rooftops and splattering windows. Under a hawthorn bush, a little black cat shivered. This little cat had no home to go to. He was all alone in the cold. Freezing water drenched his fur and trickled into his ears. I don't feel very well, he sneezed. That's it, I'm going up to the mountain. Up on the mountain, the air was clear, the water was pure, and healing herbs grew wild. So off he went up the steep and stony path out of the village. Before he'd gone very far, he met a gray goose. Good morning to you, gray goose, said the little black cat. Good morning, said the goose. Where are you going on the last day of the year? I don't feel very well, so I'm going up to the mountain. Oh, may I come too? I've eaten too much rich food. The walk will do me good. You're most welcome, said the little black cat. So off they went up the steep and stony path, two friends together. Before long, the two friends saw a white woolly lamb standing in the doorway of an old barn. Good afternoon to you, said the lamb. And where are you going on the last day of the year? I don't feel very well, so I'm going up to the mountain and Gray Goose is coming along for the walk. May I come too? I've been inside for days. I need some fresh mountain air. You're most welcome, said the little black cat. So off they went up the steep and stony path, three friends together. Before long, the three friends came to a meadow and a big brown cow gazed at them over the hedge. Good morning, mama cow said the little black cat, for he saw that the cow had a fine round belly and would soon give birth to a calf. Good evening. Where are you going all together on the last day of the year? I don't feel very well, so I'm going up to the mountain. My friend Gray Goose is coming along for the walk and so is White Lamb. May I come with you? The mountain herbs will be good for my growing baby. You're most welcome. Off they went up the steep and stony path, four friends together. Soon, dusk fell and the world turned gray and blue. The little black cat shivered, but up ahead he saw a light and he padded towards it. The light came from the window of a wooden house. The little black cat stretched up high, but it was no good, he couldn't reach it. The cow cried, lamb, climb up onto my back. Cat, climb up onto the back of lamb and goose, you climb up onto cat. The friends wobbled and wavered. They breathed and balanced. The little black cat looked in through the window. His wet nose smudged the window pane. Inside, there was a wooden table, a bench, and a single bed with a red blanket tucked in tight. In the hearth, a failing fire cast a thin light. By the fire, a little old woman sat on a rocking chair. She was rocking back and forth, talking to herself. All alone, alone on the last day of the year, without even a cat to keep me company. And oh, I'd love a cup of cocoa, but no cow, so no milk. And it is cold. If only I had some wool, I could knit myself some woolens, but no. She shifted herself on her hard wool wooden chair and the four friends watched as a tear trickled down her cheek. On the back of the lamb, on the back of the cow, the little black cat looked up at the goose. Do you know, he said, all of a sudden, I don't need the mountain anymore. Goose flapped off, cat sprang down, lamb scrambled to the ground, cow shook herself. The little black cat began to meow. The old woman got up and opened the door. Good evening, said the little black cat. May we come in? The old woman beamed. You are most welcome. She kissed the lamb and scratched the cow and stroked the gray goose. She picked up the little black cat in her arms. So the four friends stayed with a little old woman, and they never did go up to the mountain. The goose shook out her loose feathers, and the old woman made a soft cushion for her hard chair. The lamb gave the old woman warm wool to knit a shawl. The cow gave birth to a fine calf, and every evening gave the old woman creamy milk for a cup of cocoa. And by the fire, the little black cat sat on the old woman's lap and purred. The end. Hi, my name is Grace Irwin, and I'm going to read a story by Eric Carl. You probably know The Hungry Caterpillar, but this one is Dream Snow. On a small farm, 
there lived a farmer. He had only a few animals. He could count them on the fingers of one hand. So the farmer named his animals one, two, three, four, and five. By the end of, by the end of the barn stood a small tree. The farmer named it Tree. Hello, tree, he would say when he passed it. The farmer took good care of one, two, three, four, and five. Every day he fed them and cleaned their stalls. In the evening, when his farm work was done, he went to his house. Then he sat in his favorite chair, drank a cup of hot peppermint tea, and ate a slice of bread with honey on it. One night, as he sat there, the farmer felt very cozy and a bit tired. Heavens, oh, it's almost Christmas and it hasn't snowed yet. And with that, he fell asleep. Soon he dreamed of falling snowflakes. They gently covered him with a white blanket. The snowflakes gently covered one with a white blanket. Nay. The snowflakes gently covered two with a white blanket. Moo. The snowflakes gently covered three with a white blanket. Bah. The snowflakes gently covered four with a white blanket. Boink, boink. The snowflakes gently covered five with a white blanket. The farmer woke up from his dream, looked out of his window and saw snow. And it was not dream snow, it was real snow. It had snowed while he napped. Now the snow clouds had moved away. The moon and stars sparkled in the wintry night sky. One, two, three, four and five were safe and fast asleep. Oh my, oh my, said the farmer, I almost forgot. Quickly, he put on his warm coat, his warm boots, his warm hat, and his warm gloves. He grabbed a box, slung a sack over his shoulder, and dashed outside. Hmm, who does he look like? Running past one, two, three, four, and five, the farmer shouted, I almost forgot, I almost forgot. Waking up the animals, they looked and wondered what the farmer was up to now. They watched as he unpacked the box and emptied his sack. One, two, three, four, and five watched as he decorated tree. Then he shouted, Merry Christmas to all. The end. Hi, my name is Mrs. B and B stands for books. Tonight, I'm going to read you a story called The Mitten. It's a folk tale from the Ukraine, but I'm going to need your help. When I give you the thumbs up, just like this, you're going to help read the story. When I give you the thumbs up, you're going to say they were quite content together. Let's try that. They were quite content together. Great. One more time. They were quite content together. So when you see me put my thumbs up, you help me read the story, The Mitten. It was deep winter. The wind blew cold and the snow fell fast. Inside, by the warmth of the fire, sat a little boy. His grandmother was knitting him warm woolly mittens. Clickety-click, clickety-click. Wrapped up warm, the boy ran out to play. 
He rolled and climbed and slid. He made footprints and handprints in the snow. As he played, one of his mittens dropped into the snow. A wild wind whirled and the snowflakes swirled. The little boy, tired and cold, ran back home to warm his pink hands by the fire. As night fell, the wind whistled and wailed. By and by, along came a squeaky mouse. Brr, she was cold. The mouse sniffed the mitten. It was warm and cozy. She snuggled in. By and by, along came a hoppity frog. The snow is cold and your home is warm. Please, can I come in out of the storm? All right, said the mouse, come on in. The frog crawled in. So now there were two. They were quite content together. Good job. By and by, along came a lolly hare. The snow is cold and your home is warm. Please, can I come in out of the storm? All right, said the frog and the mouse. Come on in. The hare wriggled in. So now there were three. They were quite content together. Maybe a little close. By and by came a prowly fox. The snow is cold and your home is warm. Please, can I come in out of the storm? All right, said the animals, come on in. The fox squeezed in. So now there were four. They were quite content together, if a little crowded. By and by along came a howly wolf. The snow is cold and your home is warm. Please, can I come in out of the storm? All right, said the animals, come on in. Do you know how many we're up to by now? Yes, we are at number five. But they were quite content together. Though now quite rather squished. By and by along came a tusky boar. A boar is another name for a pig. The snow is cold and your home is warm. Can I please come in? All right, said the animals, come on in. The boar nosed in and now there were six. They were quite content together, but packed in very tight. By and by, along came a grumbly bear. The snow is cold and your home is warm. Please, can I come in out of the storm? All right, said the animals, come on in. The bear heaved and squeezed and growled and grunted and squished himself right into the woolly mitten. And that mitten stretched and bawled and burst. The seven friends ran helter-skelter into the winter night. The bear found a cave, the boar found a bog, the wolf found a wood, and the frog found a log. The fox found a den and the hare found a nest. The mouse found a house and somewhere to rest. Inside the house, by the warmth of the fire, the little boy watched his grandmother sitting and knitting. Clickety-click, clickety-click. A brand new pair of warm woolly mittens to replace the ones he had lost. And this time, the boy had a ball of wool of his own. His grandmother showed him just what to do. By the warmth of the fire, his nimble fingers, fingers worked. He wove a long, strong length of cord. He made a string for his new mittens to keep them together 
so they wouldn't get lost in the snow. Clickety click, clickety click. Grandmother knitted and knitted all the way to the end of the yarn. Hi, I'm Jo Wadsworth, and tonight I would like to share with you a folktale from Scotland. It's called Wee Robin Redbreast. In many countries, robins are a familiar presence in gardens all year round. In autumn, the robin's song has a subdued, wistful tone. But around Christmas time, his song becomes stronger as the robin seeks a mate. Robins are one of the few birds to sing through the winter. They are known for their curious natures and if we are mindful in our movements, especially if we are digging in the soil where earthworms live, robins are unafraid of coming close to humans. These qualities as well as their distinctive orange red breasts have made the robin a beloved feathered friend. Once there was a robin, a little round robin with a red breast. It was Christmas morning and what a glorious morning it was. The dips and hollows were white with frost and the grass glistened with dew. The beech and the bracken were warm brown in the morning sun and the earth was breathing out mist. The robin was so full of joy that he couldn't help but sing. He perched on a branch of a briar and sang his cheerful song. And below the tangle of brambles, padding along on velvet paws, came a pearl gray cat. Meow, the cat stretched luxuriously. She arched her back so the robin could see her pretty markings. Little robin, little robin, where are you going so early this morning? I'm away to the castle to sing for the king, said the robin. Hmm, a worthy journey. But before you go, hop down here. Upon my neck is a ring of beautiful white fur. Come closer and see for yourself. But the robin replied, no, no, Mistress Cat, for I've seen you worry a mouse and I've no wish to be worried by you. And away he flew. The robin journeyed from branch to branch over the gorse and over the heather until he came to rest upon a bank of grass at the edge of a field. He hopped here and there, pecking in the earth beside the hedgerow. 
At the other end of the bank was a gled, a hawk, perching on a fence post, tilting its tail to balance in the wind. The hawk shuffled along the fence with its black talons closer to the robin. The robin hopped further away, for there was a look in the hawk's eye that he did not quite like. The hawk looked over his hooked beak. He arranged his slate gray feathers so the robin could see the pattern of rich rust bars beneath his wings. Little robin, little robin, where are you going so early this morning? Asked the hawk. I'm away to the castle to sing for the king, said the robin. Ah, I wish you luck on your journey, but before you go, hop over here and I will show you what a curious feather I have upon my wing. Come closer and see for yourself. But the robin replied, no, no, Mr. Hawk, for I've seen you pluck the feathers from a linnet and I have no wish to have my feathers plucked by you. And away he flew into a thorny thicket where the hawk could not reach. So the hawk took flight soaring over the open countryside. When he was gone, the robin flew on. He went swooping over the open countryside, sweeping past the sheep until he came to rest upon a flat face of rock. The north wind ruffled his feathers and he plucked up his plumage. On the wind came a musky stench rising from underneath the rock. And from out of a hole came a pointed nose, long quivering whiskers and two pricked ears. Fox swung her splendid tail from side to side. Oh, little Robin, little Robin, where are you going so early this morning? I'm away to the castle to sing for the king, said the Robin. Ah, a noble quest. Before you go, hop down here. At the tip of my tail is a patch of white. Come closer and see for yourself. But the robin replied, oh no, no, Mistress Fox, for I've seen you catch a wee lamb and I have no wish to be caught by you. And away he flew. He flew and he flew from branch to branch, oak and ash and thorn until he reached the gray stone castle of the king. There he perched upon the windowsill of the king's bedchamber. But in the ivy underneath the window ledge, someone was already singing. Someone round and brown with an upright tail, little Jenny Wren. The robin greeted the wren politely with a nod and a bow. The little wren bobbed a curtsy. Together they sang a winter song. The king and the queen came to the window to listen and the winter singing made their hearts rejoice. Still today, if you listen carefully, you can hear the midwinter music of Robin Redbreast and little Jenny Wren. The end. Thank you. Away, away, away. It's time to get ready for Kwanzaa. First, we get the Ganere Ganora it's made of shiny wood I put and seven candles three wood one black three green we light a candle every night to celebrate a special idea. Okay. 
Mommy brings the canola. The unity cup for each child we place one ear of corn called Mufodi on a straw mat my water adds apples, yams, nuts, and stocks and squash. The few fruit, I mean, fruits and vegetables, and then I'll remind us of the end of the heaviest harvest and the bringing of the plant, planting seasons. Manja, Umoja, Unity. On the first day of Kwanzaa, neighbors come to visit. We ask Kumari Ganya and Gani. That means, what's the news? We laugh and talk and sing. We are friends and family. Koji Chagoria means self determined nation. On the second day of Kwanzaa, I asked mommy to raid my hair in a fancy African way. It makes me feel proud. You, Jima, working together. On the third day of Kwanzaa, we plant flowers in the lot next door. We all work together to make our neighborhood pretty. Ma Ujama help our neighborhood grow. On the fourth day of Kwanzaa, we buy special food for our celebration. We like to shop in our neighborhood stores to keep our businesses strong Nia purpose on the fifth day of Kwanda I dream of what can be someday I will be an African dancer like my aunt Tisha. Kumaba. Kuma 
aber cool. Creative activity. Creativity on the sixth day of on the sixth day of Kwanzaa. Cash my cash in and I paint my cousin and my and I paint a clay pot and weave some baskets. We will make our house beautiful. Money faith. On the seventh day of Kwanzaa, we light the last candle to show our, our faith in ourselves, our family, and our our future and our past. Grandma gives us. Tiwadi gift for purposes, promises we have kept all year, a handmade doll for me and an Africa, Africa, can Africa, African. Shaker gown for my brother. At last, it is time for the feast. We call it Kuma Kumawu. Friends come over, and everyone cooks delicious African food. The house smells so good: spicy chicken and sweet yam. We all take a sip from the unity cup and share our wonderful meal. We sing, dance, play music, and celebrate Happy Kwanzaa. Great when a student reads. Well, well, I do, I do know that the time. Yeah, that book is yours. Okay, let's let your mom read now. <laughs> <laughs> Happy Kwanzaa, everyone. That was Caleb, my son, Caleb Williams Baxley, and I'm Tierra Williams here to bring you another Kwanzaa story: the Seven Spools of Thread. In a small African village in the country of Ghana, there lived an old man and his seven sons. After the death of his wife, 
the old man became both father and mother to the boys. The seven brothers were handsome young men. Their skin was as smooth and as dark as the finest mahogany wood. Their limbs were as straight and strong as a warrior's spears. But they were a disappointment to their father. From morning until night, the family's small home was filled with the sound of the brothers quarreling. As soon as the sun brought forth a new day, the brothers began to argue. They argued all morning how to tend the crops. They argued all afternoon about the weather. It is hot, said the middle son. No, a cool breeze is blowing, said the second son. They argued all evening about when to return home. It will be dark soon, said the youngest son. Let's finish this row and begin to a new tomorrow. No, it's too early to stop called the third son. Can't you see the sun is setting, shouted the sixth son. And so it would continue until the moon beamed down and the stars twinkled in the sky. At mealtime, the young men argued until the stew was cold and the fufu was hard. You gave him more than you gave me, whined the third son. I divided the food equally, said their father. I will starve with this only this small portion on my plate, complained the youngest. If you don't want it, I'll eat it, said the oldest son. He grabbed a handful of meat from his brother's place. Stop being so greedy, said the youngest. And so it went on every night. It was often morning before the seven brothers finished dinner. One sad day, the old man died and was buried. At sunrise the next morning, the village chief called the brothers before him. Your father has left an inheritance, said the chief. The brothers whispered excitedly among themselves. I know my father left me everything because I am the oldest son, said the oldest. I know my father left me everything because I am the youngest son, said the youngest. He left everything to me, said the middle son. I know I was his favorite. Eh, said the second son, everything is mine. The brothers began shouting and shoving. Soon, all seven were rolling around on the ground, hitting and kicking each other. Stop that this instant, the chief shouted. The brothers stopped fighting. They shook the dust off their clothes and sat before the chief, eyeing each other suspiciously. Your father has decreed that all of his property and possessions will be divided among you equally, said the chief. But first, by the time the moon rises tonight, you must learn how to make gold out of these spools of silk thread. If you do not, you will be turned out your home as beggars. The oldest brother received the blue red thread the next brother red, the next yellow, the middle son was given orange thread, the next green, the next black, and the youngest son received the white thread. For once, the brothers were speechless. The chief spoke again. From this moment forward, you must not argue among yourselves or raise your hand in anger towards one another. If you do, your father's property and all his possessions will be divided equally among the poorest of the villagers. Go quickly. You only have a little time. The brothers bowed to the chief and hurried away. When the seven Ashanti brothers arrived at their farm, something unusual happened. They sat side by side from the oldest to the youngest without saying anything unkind to each other. My brothers, the oldest said after a while, let us shake hands and make peace among ourselves. Let us never argue a fight again, said the youngest brother. The brothers placed their hands together and held each other tightly. For the first time in years, peace rested within the walls of their home. 
My brothers, said the third son quietly, surely our father would not turn us into the world as beggars. I agree, said the middle son. I do not believe our father would have given us the task of turning thread into gold if it were impossible. Could it be, said the oldest son, that there might be small pieces of gold in this thread? The sun beamed hotly overhead. Yellow streams of light crept inside the hut. Each brother held up his spool of thread. The beautiful colors sparkled in the sunlight, but there were no nuggets of gold in these spools. I am not, I'm afraid not, my brother, said the sick son, but this was a good idea. Thank you, my brother, said the oldest. Could it be, said the youngest son, that by making something from this thread, we could earn a fortune in gold? Perhaps, said the oldest, we could make cloth out of this thread and sell it. I believe we can do it. This is a good plan, said the middle son, but we don't have enough money of any one color to make a full bolt of cloth. What if, said the third son, we weave the thread together and make a cloth of many colors? But our people don't wear cloth like that, said the fifth son. We only wear cloth of one color. Maybe, said the second son. We could make a cloth that is so special, everyone will want to wear it. My brothers, said the sixth son, we could finish faster if we all work together. I know we can succeed, said the middle son. The seven Ashanti brothers went to work together they cut wood to make a loom. The younger brothers held pieces together while the other bro older brothers assembled the loom. They took turns weaving cloth out of their spools of thread. They made a pattern of stripes and shapes that looked like wings of birds. They used all the colors, blue, red, yellow, orange, green, black, and white. Soon, the brothers had several pieces of beautiful multi-colored cloth. When the cloth was finished, the seven brothers took turns neatly folding the bright colored fabric. Then they placed it into seven baskets and put the baskets on their heads. The brothers formed a line from the oldest to the youngest and began the journey to the village. The sun slowly made a golden path across the sky. The brothers hurried down the long, dusty road as quickly as they could. As soon as they entered the marketplace, the seven Ashanti brothers called out, Come and buy the most wonderful cloth in the world. Come and buy the most wonderful cloth in the world. They unfolded a bolt and held it up for all to see. The multicolored fabric glistened like a rainbow. A crowd gathered around the seven Ashanti brothers. Oh, said one villager, I've never seen cloth so beautiful. Look at that unusual pattern. Ah, said another, this is the finest fabric in all the land. Feel the texture. The brothers smiled proudly. Suddenly, a man dressed in magnificent robes pushed his way to the front of the crowd. Everyone stepped back respectfully. It was the king's treasurer. He rubbed the cloth between the palm of his hands, then he held it up to the sunlight. What a thing of beauty, he said, fingering the material. This cloth will make a wonderful gift for the king. I must have all of it, the seven brothers whispered together. Cloth fit for a king, said the oldest should be purchased at a price only a king could pay. It is yours for one bag of gold. Sold, said the king's treasurer. He untied his bag of gold and spilled out many pieces for the brothers. The seven Ashanti brothers ran out of the market place and back down the road to their village. A shining silver moon began to creep up in the sky. Painting and dripping with sweat, the brothers threw themselves before the chief's hut. Oh, chief, said the oldest, we have turned the thread into gold. 
the chief came out of his hut and sat upon the stool. The oldest brother poured the gold out onto the ground. Have you argued or fought today? Asked the chief. No, my chief, said the youngest. We've been too busy working together to argue or fight. Then you have learned the lesson your father sought to teach you, said the chief. All that he has is now yours. The brother smiled happily, but the youngest brother looked sad. What about the poor people in the village? He asked. We receive an inheritance, but what will they do? Perhaps, said the oldest, we can teach them how to turn thread into gold. The chief smiled. You have learned your lesson very well. The seven Ashanti brothers taught their people carefully. The village became famous for its beautiful multicolored cloth and the villagers prospered. From that day until this, the seven Ashanti brothers have worked together farming the land and they have worked peacefully in honor of their father. The end. Hello, everyone. We're really enjoying these stories. Happy holidays. I am Kathy, and I am here with my friend Johnny. Yeah, yeah right. I'm right here. No, no, Polly, you stay over there while we read the story. Or no, you have to. Johnny and Polly. Hello. Hello. All right. I'll get you crackers later, Polly. You go wait over there and enjoy the story. All right, everyone else, gather around. All right. We're going to read you a pirate story. We are. Yes. A pirate holiday story. A pirate holiday story. Yeah. Right. Yes, it's called Treasure Island. No, no, and that is that is not what it is called, actually. Treasure Island Christmas Carol. Nope. Want to know what is it? Nope. It is uh... Ah, a pirate's night before Christmas. Yes, a pirate's night before Christmas. And it's Arr. written by Philip Yates. And the pictures that we will share with you are by Sebastian Serra. And here's the cover. Yar. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. How about I'll read it and then um, I'll, I'll tell you when you can help me. Okay? Oh, all right. All right. All right. Very good. All right. Pirates night before Christmas. Was the night before Christmas aboard the Black Sark. Not a creature was stirring, not even a shark. Wait, should I do like a piratey voice? Darr, if you can. All right, I'll try. I'll try. Do I have an accent? A little bit. Well, I might have one too. It's hard I to hear notice. it. It's hard to hear it on yourself. Right. All right. Let me try again. All right. Start <laughs> over. Now I'm nervous. Twas the night before Christmas aboard the Black Sark. How's that? I think she's got it. All right. Not a creature was stirring. Not even a shark. That just flows better, you know. There you go. The stockings were stuck to the bowsprit with tar in hopes that Sir Peggotty soon would be thar. The pirates were snoring like pigs in their beds, while visions of treasure chests danced in their heads. Is that what you dream of, Johnny? Sometimes, yes. All right. And I, with me spyglass and scruffy old dog, stood watch in the crow's nest for ships in the fog. When out in the mist there arose such a racket, I slid down the mast with me sword to attack it. Away to the poop deck, I ran very fast. Arr! You, you said poop. I did. I threw up the anchor and shouted, Avast! Yar, that was good. Thank you. Avast. Avast. Straight up from the sea in the foamy white spray flew eight giant seahorses pulling a sleigh. A mean looking driver a hoist in one leg. Well, shiver me timbers, it must be Sir Peg. It's almost your turn. All right. All right. <clears throat> More sluggish than flounders, his coursers they came, and he whistled and snarled and called them by name. All right, your turn. 
now salty, now scurvy, now Sinbad and Molly. On cutthroat, on cross-eyed, on Roger and Jolly. To the top of the sail, to the tip of the mast. Now dash away, dash away, dash away fast. Very good. And when with a cry and a crack of his whip, down came his sleigh on the deck of our ship, a jolly old sea dog, enormously fat, and so was the parrot that perched on his hat. Oh, come up here, Polly. Beep. All right, good job, Polly. Yes, I'll get you crackers, don't worry. <laughs> You're being very good. He was dressed all in black from his head to his heels, and his clothes were all covered with seaweed and eels. His eye, how it twinkled, his dreadlocks, how twiny, his scars were like crossbones. His gold tooth, how shiny. His mouth was turned up with a nasty old look. The silver gleamed sharp on the point of his hook. A scary white skull he had hung on his ear soon gave me to know I had nothing to fear. I guess because I'm a pirate, I'm not afraid of the skull earring. Right. He spoke not a word, but went straight to his sack and stuffed all the stockings with coins and hardtack. Yeah. Yes, Polly, hardtack is like crackers. We will get you some crackers. <laughs> the black sark was soon filled with holiday cheer and loaded with gifts for each good buccaneer. A good buccaneer. Let's put the rim. Anchors and hornpipes and cackle fruit eggs, pearls and red sashes for Bonnie and Meg, a cauldron for cook filled with pieces of shank, and just for the cabin, a shiny new plank. But oh, me heart broken and tears in the eyes, I said to myself, Blimey, where is me prize? I got nothing. But he hopped in his sleigh to his team, gave a roar. Oh, that's me. It's time to return to the briny deep floor. Then, just when I thought it's me worst Christmas day, a parchment of paper flew down off the sleigh. Hmm. Grocery list, perhaps. And it was the best present I ever got. A map to a treasure. X marks the spot. I laughed and I danced and I shouted with glee. And up went his sleigh and then down to the sea. But I heard him exclaim ere he splashed near a star. Merry Christmas, me buckles, and a happy new yar. <laughs> new yar. Happy holidays, everyone. Thank oh, you. don't run away yet. Hi. Hello there. Sweet, sweet. All right, I got to get crackers. <laughs> He's headed off. So I believe Adam Swartz Puppets has a few things coming up, don't they? Oh, we do. We do have some things coming up. Tell we us, are, tell us. Well, tomorrow we will be in Belfont at the Victorian Christmas. We'll mm -hmm. be at Breakfast with Santa with uh, some of our puppet friends from A Christmas Carol. Uh, Scrooge will be there and Johnny, will you be there? What? No. Uh, no, I, I will no, not you're be not, there. You're I not have to be scrubbing. Care. I have to scrub the poop. Down. Right. Scrooge will be there and Marley will be there and Fred will be there. Right. Some other yeah. ghosts will be there. And then good on spirits. Good spirits. Yes, good spirits. On December 20th at the State Theater, we are doing a production of A Christmas Carol. Woo! And <laughs> now let me see. How could we find out about this? Uh, well, you could go to adamswartzpuppets.com. Uh, or, oh no, is it the statetheater.org? I'm not sure what the State Theater's website is. That's terrible. That's go all right. Go to adamsworthpuppets.com. It's, it's on there. 
<laughs> so adamswartzpuppets.com. You can also find that information out on Central PA Theater and Dance Fest, right? Yes. And tempestproductions.org. So you can go there and find links to where Adam and Kathy will be next. Yay. Thank you guys so much. Thank You're welcome. you. This be a jolly good time. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Jolly holiday. You're a right. jolly holiday. I'm going to be talking like this for the rest of the night. <laughs> <laughs> so have fun out there. All right. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So we're moving into the second part of our broadcast for this evening. And I have another riddle for you because I know you've been waiting and waiting and waiting. Are you ready? What do you call a person who is afraid of Santa Claus? I'm dancing here for you. Anybody got an answer? Anybody in my studio audience got an answer? I believe Lori Wilson just got it. Claustrophobic. Yay! What did Mrs. Claus say to Santa when she looked up in the sky? <laughs> what she said was, looks like rain, dear. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, Mrs. B is giving me attitude right now. So maybe I'm just going to skip her poems. But up next is Mrs. B, and she is going to share some poetry with you that is lots and lots of fun. I would never let her skip our poems, <laughs> never. The first of the two poems I have for you tonight is by Mick Gower and it's called Christmas Thank Yous. Dear auntie, oh, what a nice jumper. I've always fancied myself to powder blue and fancy of thinking of the orange and pink stripes. How clever of you. Dear uncle, the soap is terrific, so useful, and such a kind thought. And how did you guess that I had just used the last of the soap from last Christmas bought? Dear Gran, many thanks for the hankies. Now I really can't wait for the flu. And the daisies embroidered in red around the M for Michael. How thoughtful of you. Dear cousin, what socks? And the same sort that you wear? So you must be the last word in style. I am certain you're right that the luminous green will make me stand out a mile. Dear sister, I quite understand your concern. It's a risk sending jam in the post, but I think I've pulled out all the big bits of glass, so I won't taste too sharp spread on toast. Dear granddad, don't fret. I'm delighted, so don't think your gift will offend. I'm not at all hurt that you gave up this year and sent me a fiver to spend. So you can see the little boys writing his thank you notes. Look at his face. Mm. The second poem that I have for you today is by Jack Prolutsky and it's called, My Mother's Got Me Bundled Up. My mother's got me bundled up in tons of winter clothes. You could not recognize me if I did not have a nose. I'd wear much less, but she'd get mad if I dared disobey her. So I stay wrapped up from head to toe in layer after layer. I am wearing extra sweaters and I'm wearing extra socks. My galoshes are so heavy, my ankles seem like rocks. I am wearing scarves and earmuffs. I am wearing itchy pants. My legs feel like they're swarming with million tiny, tiny ants. My mittens are enormous. My coat weighs more than me. My woolen hat and ski mask make it difficult to see. 
It's hard to move. And when I try, I waddle, then I flop. I'm living, breathing model of a clo walking clothing shop. And there he is bundled up while his friends are waiting to go play in the snow. I'm back and Jim is going to join me for a reading of Yes, Virginia. Dear editor, I am eight years old. Some of my little friends say there is no Santa Claus. Papa says, if you see it in the sun, it is so. Please tell me the truth. Is there a Santa Claus? Virginia O'Hanlon, 115 West 95th Street. Virginia, your little friends are wrong. They have been affected by the skepticism of a skeptical age. They do not believe except they see. They think that nothing can be which is not comprehensible by their little minds. All minds, Virginia, whether they be men's or children's, are little. In this great universe of ours, man is a mere insect, an ant in his intellect as compared with the boundless world around him, as measured by the intelligence capable of grasping the whole of truth and knowledge. Yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus. He exists as certainly as love and generosity and devotion exist. And you know that they abound and give to your life its highest beauty and joy. Alas, how dreary would the world be if there were no Santa Claus. It would be as dreary as if there were no Virginias. There would be no childlike faith then, no poetry, no romance to make tolerable this existence. We should have no enjoyment except in sense and sight. The eternal light with which childhood fills the world would be extinguished. Not believe in Santa Claus, you might as well not believe in fairies. You might get your papa to hire men to watch all the chimneys on Christmas Eve to catch Santa Claus, but even if they did not see Santa Claus coming down, what would that prove? Nobody sees Santa Claus, but that is no sign that there is no Santa Claus. The most real things in the world are those that neither children nor men can see. Did you ever see fairies dancing on the lawn? Of course not, but that's no proof that they are not there. Nobody can conceive or imagine all the wonders there are unseen and unseeable in the world. You may tear apart the baby's rattle, see what makes the noise inside, but there is a veil covering the unseen world, which not the strongest man, nor even the united strength of all the strongest men that ever lived could tear apart. Only faith, fancy, poetry, love, romance, can push aside that curtain and view and picture the sup supernal beauty and glory beyond. Is it all real? Ah, Virginia, in all the world, there is nothing else real and abiding. No Santa Claus. Thank God he lives and he lives forever. A thousand years from now, Virginia, nay, 10 times 10,000 years from now, he will continue to make glad the heart of childhood. Thank you, and yes, there is a Santa Claus. I believe in Santa Claus. Who out there believes in Santa? That was, I hope that you were much more enthusiastic at home than my <laughs> studio crowd is. So up next is one of those beautiful, beautiful illustrated books that has been turned into a movie that a lot of families go out and see, and that is The Polar Express. Polar Express by Chris Van Allsburg. On Christmas Eve many years ago, I lay quietly in my bed. I did not rustle the sheets. I breathed slowly and silently. 
I was listening for a sound, a sound a friend had told me I'd never hear. The ringing bells of Santa's sleigh. There is no Santa, my friend had insisted, but I knew he was wrong. Late that night, I did hear sounds, though not of ringing bells. From outside came the sounds of hissing steam and squeaking metal. I looked through my window and saw a train standing perfectly still in front of my house. It was wrapped in an apron of steam. Snowflakes fell lightly around it. A conductor stood at the open door of one of the cars. He took a large pocket watch from his vest, then looked up at my window. I put on my slippers and robe. I tiptoed downstairs and out the door. All aboard, the conductor cried out. I ran up to him. Well, he said, are you coming? Where, I asked. Why, to the North Pole, of course, was his answer. This is the Polar Express. I took his outstretched hand and he pulled me aboard. The train was filled with other children, all in their pajamas and nightgowns. We sang Christmas carols and ate candies with nougat centers as white as snow. We drank hot cocoa as thick and rich as melted chocolate bars. Outside, the lights of towns and villages flickered in the distance as the Polar Express raced northward. Soon, there were no more lights to be seen. We traveled through cold, dark forests where lean wolves roamed and white-tailed rabbits hid from our train as it thundered through the quiet wilderness. We climbed mountains so high it seemed as if we would scrape the moon, but the Polar Express never slowed down. Faster and faster we ran along, rolling over peaks and through valleys like a car on a roller coaster. The mountains turned into hills, the hills to snow-covered plains. We crossed a barren desert of ice, the great polar ice cap. Lights appeared in the distance. They looked like the lights of a strange ocean liner sailing on a frozen sea. There, said the conductor, is the North Pole. The North Pole. It was a huge city standing alone at the top of the world filled with factories where every Christmas toy was made. At first we saw no elves. They're gathering at the center of the city, the conductor told us. That's where Santa will give the first gift of Christmas. Who receives the first gift, we all asked. The conductor answered, he will choose one of you. Look, shouted one of the children, the elves. Outside, we saw hundreds of elves. As our train drew closer to the center of the North Pole, we slowed to a crawl. So crowded were the streets with Santa's helpers. When the Polar Express could go no farther, we stopped and the conductor led us outside. We pressed through the crowd to the edge of a large open circle. In front of us stood Santa's sleigh. The reindeer were excited. They pranced and paced, ringing the silver sleigh bells that hung from their harnesses. It was a magical sound like nothing I'd ever heard. Across the circle, the elves moved apart and Santa Claus appeared. The elves cheered wildly. He marched over to us and pointing to me said, Let's have this fellow here. He jumped into his sleigh. The conductor handed me up. I sat, I sat on Santa's knee and he asked, now what would you like for Christmas? I knew that I could have any gift I could imagine, but the thing I wanted most for Christmas was not inside Santa's giant bag, what I wanted more than anything was one silver bell from Santa's sleigh. When I asked, Santa smiled. Then he gave me a hug and told an elf to cut a bell from a reindeer's harness. The elf tossed it up to Santa. I stood, excuse me, he stood holding the bell high above him and called out the first gift, gift of Christmas.
clock struck midnight as the elves roared their approval. Santa handed the bell to me and I put it in my bathrobe pocket. The conductor helped me down from the sleigh. Santa shouted out the reindeer's names and cracked his whip. His team charged forward and climbed into the air. Santa circled once above us and then disappeared into the cold, dark polar sky. As soon as we were back inside the Polar Express, the other children asked to see the bell. I reached into my pocket, but the only thing I felt was a hole. I had lost the silver bell from Santa Claus's sleigh. Let's hurry outside and look for it, one of the children said. But the train gave a sudden lurch and started moving. We were on our way home. It broke my heart to lose the bell. When the train reached my house, I sadly left the other children. I stood at my doorway and waved goodbye. The conductor said something from the moving train, but I couldn't hear him. What? I yelled out. He cupped his hands around his mouth. Merry Christmas, he shouted. The Polar Express let out a loud, loud blast from its whistle and sped away. On Christmas morning, my little sister Sarah and I opened our presents. When it looked as if everything had been unwrapped, Sarah found one last small box behind the tree. It had my name on it. Inside was the silver bell. There was a note. Found this on the seat of my sleigh. Fix that hole in your pocket. Signed, Mr. C. I shook the bell. It made the most beautiful sound my sister and I had ever heard. But my mother said, oh, that's too bad. Yes, said my father, it's broken. When I had shaken the bell, my parents had not heard a sound. At one time, most of my friends could hear the bell, but as years passed, it fell silent for all of them. Even Sarah found one Christmas that she could no longer hear its sweet sound. Though I've grown old, the bell still rings for me as it does for all who truly believe. Today I'll be reading three poems. The first is Flame Heart by Claude McKay. So much I have forgotten in 10 years. So much in 10 brief years I have forgot. What time the purple apples come to juice and what month brings the shy forget me not. Forgotten is the special startling season of some beloved trees flowering and fruiting, what time of year the ground doves brown the fields and fill the noonday with their curious fluting. I have forgotten much, but I still remember the poinsettias red, blood red in warm December. I still recall the honey fever grass, but I cannot bring back to mind just when we rooted them out of the ping wind path to stop the mad bees in the rabbit pen. I often try to think in what sweet, sweet month the languid painted ladies used to dapple. The yellow by road mazing from the main, sweet with the golden threads of the rose apple. I have forgotten strange but quite remembered the poinsettias red, blood red in warm December. What weeks 
What months, what time, oh, the mild year. We cheated school to have our fling at tops. What days our wine throw bodies pulsed with joy, feasting upon blackberries in the cops. Oh, some I know, I have embalmed the days, even the sacred moments when we played. All innocent of passion, uncorrupt. At noon and evening in the flame's heart shade, we were so happy, happy. I remember beneath the poinsettia's red in warm December. Christmas Eve, My Mother's Dressing by Toy Dercott. My mother was not impressed with her beauty. Once a year, she put it on like a costume, plaited her black hair, slick as corn slilk down past her hips, and one rope thick braid turned it carefully, hand over hand and fixed in the nape of her neck, stiff and elegant as a crown with tortoise pins like like huge insects, some belonging to her dead mother, some belonging to my living grandmother sitting on the stool at the mirror. She applied a, a peachy foundation that seemed to hold her down, to trap her, as if never would have noticed what flew among us, unless it was weighted and bound in its mask. Vaseline shined her eyebrows, mascara blackened her lashes until they swept down like feathers. Her eyes deepened until they shone from far away. Now, I remember her hands, her poor hands, which even then were old from scrubbing, whiter on the inside than they should have been and hard. The first joints of her fingers, little fattened pads, the nails filed to sharp points like, like old fashioned ink pens painted in a jolly color. Her hands stood next to her face and wanted to be put away. Prayed for the scrub, bucket and brush to make them useful. And as I write, I forget the years I watched her pull hairs like a witch from her chin, magnifying every blot, as if acid were thrown from the inside. But once a year, my mother rose in her white silk slip, not the slave of the house, the woman, took the iron dress from the hanger, allowing me to stand on the bed so that I looked face directly into her face and hold the garment away from her as she pulled it down. Those Winter Sundays by Robert Hayden. Sundays too, my father got up early and put on his clothes, on in the blue-black cold. Then with cracked hands that ached from labor in the weekday weather made, thanked fire's blaze. No one ever thanked him. I'd wake and hear the cold splintering, breaking. When the rooms were warm, he'd call and I'd slowly I would rise and dress, fearing the chronic angers of that house, speaking indifferently to him, who had driven out the cold and polished my good shoes as well. What did I know? What did I know of love's austere and lonely offices? Thank you. The Lightkeeper's Box. At the beginning of the world, the, by the waters of the Orinoco River, there was no day. The people had only wooden torches to light their villages. By the flicker of their fires, neither night nor day truly existed. In the midst of one village lived a chief with two daughters. 
News came to the chief of a man somewhere who kept the light. The man called to his oldest daughter and said, go and see where this young light keeper is and bring some light to me. Then he blew on her face so that the hips of the bush, water and sky might keep her safe. The young woman wearing her most lovely Marisha apron packed herself a small sack and left. Just outside the village, she found many roads on which to travel. She didn't know which one to take. The one she finally chose led her to the house of deer. He greeted her with his soft eyes and his antlers like fuzzy tree branches above his smooth ears. She stayed with deer a long time, laughing, talking, and loving with him. When at last she returned to her father, however, she did not have the light. The father decided to send his younger daughter. Go and see where the young light keeper is and bring some light to me, he blew on her face. I will play my flute for you too, he said. The young woman combed out her hair and set off. She too came to the many roads and could not decide which one to take, but she heard the faint sound of her father's flute and a feeling about the roads crept over her. They seemed to have faces and she chose the one that seemed strong and old. Finally, after much walking, she came to the house of the light keeper. The light keeper's face was as young as the road had seemed old. I have come to meet you, she said, and to get some light from you for my father. I have been waiting for you, the light keeper answered. Now that you have arrived, come stay with me. The young man took up a box made of a tightly woven Aitariti leaves that he had at his side, carefully so that the dreams inside would not spill out. He opened it. The light colored his sinewy arms brown and his teeth white. It poured a sheen over his black hair and dark eyes. And so the young woman discovered light. After showing it to her, the young man closed the lid of the Aitariti leaf box. But every day, the light keeper opened his Aitariti box so that he and the young woman could enjoy themselves in the light. They laughed and played sweetly as honey wine. But it happened that one day the young woman remembered she had to return to her father and bring to him what he had sent her to find. The light keeper held the woman close. Then, as a present, he gave her the Aitariti box filled with dreams and light. I want to you to take this with you, he said. The young woman found her father asleep in his hammock. Father, she whispered. The heavens have left me safe and I have brought you light. The chief woke fully and welcomed her. She showed him the light trapped in the leaf box. He hung the box from one of the stilts that held up his house. Its dreams drifted out and rays of the light touched the crinkled water of the Orinoco, the fan-shaped leaves of the IT palm and the yellow red fruits of the Mary. Word spread to all the neighboring villages that a family down the river had light. People traveled to see it for themselves. They arrived in their long purple heart bark canoes down this channel and that, boats and more boats filled with people and more people. Everyone packed themselves inside the house of the chief. They marveled at the light and at the new pictures that came while they slept. The man and his daughters fried fish after, sh after shimmering fish for their guests. Even their porch filled with people until the slim stilts of the house could no longer hold the weight of so many. But since the light's clarity was so much more agreeable than the firelit darkness, no one yeah. left. Finally, the chief could not stand so many people. I am going to end this, he said. We all want the light, so here it goes. With a wonderfully strong toss, he hurled the Aitariti box and its light into the sky. The body of the light flew to the east and the box rolled to the west. The body of the light became the sun and the box tightly woven of leaves as it was turned into the moon. 
On one side was the sun and on the other, the moon. But because the chief's throw had been so powerful, the sun and the moon moved very rapidly. The day and the night were very short with sunrise and sunset following quick upon each other. The chief had an idea. Bring me, he said to his younger daughter, a little turtle. The young woman brought a small gray turtle cupped in her hands. The father blew on the turtle and then waited until the sun was just overhead. Son, I'm giving you a present, he called out. Take this turtle to be your friend. She is yours. I give her to you. Wait for her. Then he took up his flute. The little turtle journeyed up to the sun, the sweet notes of the flute warbling beneath her. And because turtles do not hurry, sun had to wait a long time for his gift. When turtle finally reached him, sun walked very slowly across the sky so that he might keep step with his new companion. Moon ambled across the sky so that is not to interrupt the beginning of this new friendship. And to this day, when sun gets up in the morning, almost always he travels at turtle's pace so that the day lasts just long enough until the night comes to the world by the Orinoco River. The end. Tanuki's Gold, a folktale from Japan. The Tanuki is a member of the dog family that lives wild in the forests of Japan. Like its cousin, the fox, the Tanuki is small and agile with a pointed snout and short legs, but its silky fur is striped like a badger or a raccoon. The Tanuki is famed in legends of old Japan as a magical creature one favorite tale tells of a shape-shifting tanuki who could change to a kettle and perform amazing acrobatics, bringing a great good luck. This tale celebrates the way that when winter weather keeps us indoors, we feel especially grateful for the company of dear friends. Mukashi, Mukashi, very, very long ago, an old priest lived alone. He spent his day in prayer and meditation. He never needed to bother with earthly things for the local people brought him clothes and food and patched his roof in the winter. One winter's evening, the priest was deep in prayer. He knelt before the statue of Buddha. He struck his bell and listened to the sound resound until it's still to silence. Niall, what was that? From outside came a pitiful sound. The priest opened the door and there, shivering in the cold, was a tanuki. Your holiness, implored the creature, please may I come in and warm myself by your fire? It's bitterly cold. The priest's eyes opened wide in surprise. He knew that tanuki hi hibernate in the winter. Why aren't you in your burrow, he asked. In winters past, the freezing frost and mountain snow were nothing to me. But now I grow old. I feel the cold in my bones. Please let me in. Of course, of course, said the kind-hearted priest, full of compassion. The tanuki lay thaw thawing by the fire, eyes closed in exhaustion wet fur steaming gently. The priest continued his prayers. The tanuki slept by the sunken hearth all night, and in the morning he padded away. The next night, the tanuki returned, and the next, and the next. He brought with him fallen sticks and dead leaves for the fire, and the old priest grew fond of the sight of him sleeping by the hearth. The white fluff of his tummy rose and fell with the gentle rhythm of his snores. The priest noticed that when he gazed upon the tanuki asleep in such deep peace, he felt peace in his own body too. His breath, his breathing slowed. 
His gaze softened. He stroked the creature's silky fur. Sometimes the priest sat and sipped a bowl of green tea and the tanuki, the tanuki curled beside him. Its warm weight was comfortable. It made him feel content. And there's our tanuki curled by the tea. When winter was over, the winter snow gave way to pink blossom and Tanuki came to the hut no more. And when winter came again, the Tanuki always returned and the old priest greeted his old friend with a glad heart. This went on for many years until one day the Tanuki said, you have been so kind to me. If it wasn't for you, I would surely have perished long ago in the cold. I wish there was something I could give you to repay your kindness. The old priest laughed. Oh, dear Tanuki, you have a good heart, but I have no need of things. I am a priest. I have given up the pleasures of the world. My neighbors give me all the food and clothes I need. Thank you, Tanuki, but I need nothing from you. But the Tanuki asked the old priest the same question again and again. At last, the priest relented. As you are so keen to give me a gift, I shall share one thing with you. If I had three gold coins, I could take them to the holy shrine and pay for prayers to be said for me after my death so that I may enter the Western paradise. That evening, the Tanuki did not come back nor the next, nor the next. The priest stood at the door, peering into the night. Oh, I was a fool to ask for gold, he thought. What if Tanuki tried to steal gold from me and has been killed? Perhaps even now he is lying dead in the snow. Every night the priest prayed for the little animal. Years passed with no word from the creature until one winter's evening, while the priest was deep in prayer, he heard a noise from outside. Niaul! There in the moonlight was the little animal. Tanuki, come in, come in. I'm so glad you're here. Where have you been? Tanuki held out his paw, and there were three gold coins, just as the priest had wished. I knew you wouldn't want stolen gold, so I journeyed to the Isle of Sado, where men mine metal, and I gathered the rocks they left behind, and I made these for you. Oh, Tanuki, cried the priest, his eyes glistening with tears. Thank you. He held the coins to his head, a sign of great respect. I am truly grateful, and yet I see now, dear Tanuki, that the thing I treasure most is you. From the, that day on, whenever winter came around, the re Tanuki returned to, to the old priest's hut. In the glow of the firelit room, they sat at peace, listening to the purr of the flames, warm and content. Each evening, the company of a dear old friend. In the summertime, when the evenings are light, many children are in bed before nightfall. The long, dark evenings of winter offer people of all ages a special chance to appreciate the stars and the moon that light the night sky. Throughout history, people have looked up at the sky in wonder, and their wonder is reflected in shining tales that celebrate the magic and the mystery of the moon. <coughs> A Cloak for the Moon, a Jewish folktale from Poland. Up in the sky, the moon was cold. She wished she had a winter cloak to wear. She dreamed of being wrapped up warm. All around the world, people were wrapped up against the weather. The moon looked down and saw grandmas in cozy shawls and fine ladies in flowing coats and gloves of leather. She saw men with scarves pulled up to their mouths and hands thrust deep in their pockets. 
She saw children bundled up as round as bread rolls. Even the Arctic hare was wearing her white winter coat. Up in the sky, the moon dreamed of a warm cloak. But down on Earth, the scientists said, impossible, it can't be done. Because of course, the moon is always changing. Sometimes she's a slender curve. Sometimes she's round and full. How could anyone possibly make a cloak to fit her? But there was one young man, a tailor, who loved the moon. He loved her radiance, her mystery, her magic. I'll do it, he said, I'll try. So the tailor went to an ancient library. He found an old, old book. And with the tips of his fingers, he traced the curls on the leather cover. He blew off a cloud of dust and opened the pages. The faded paper smelt of long ago. His finger followed the trails of rich brown ink, and he discovered that once upon a time, in the kingdom on the roof of the world, a way had been found to weave cloth from light, just right. Without another word, the tailor set off. He traveled over vast stony plains, through cities built of sand-colored stone, and valleys where longhorn yaks roamed, until at last he came to the roof of the world. And there, outside the doorway of her little wooden house, an old woman sat spinning in the sunshine. Is that the thread spun from light? asked the tailor. <laughs> the old woman laughed a dry leaf laugh. <laughs> no, no, that art was lost long ago. The last piece of the cloth of light is kept up in that temple. The woman pointed to a mountain far away in the distance. The shadow of a temple was just visible at the top. So the tailor scrambled up the mountain and pushed open the temple's heavy oak door. Inside, in the lamplit gloom, the tailor could hear the monks chanting, and he peered through the clouds of incense smoke. At the back of the temple, was a room painted with scrolling patterns of copper green and blue, vermilion and gold, and in the middle of the room was a great wooden trunk. The tailor knelt before the trunk. With trembling hands, he lifted the lid. Inside was a scrap of fabric no bigger than his hand. It was too small to make a cloak for a mouse, let alone a cloak for the moon. Exhausted, he slumped down with a tatter of cloth in his hand and cried. He cried for his long journey, his wasted time, his broken dream. He cried and he cried until he fell asleep. He dreamed he was curled inside a cocoon like a caterpillar and he was pulling a thread from his own body. And when he woke, there was something as fine as silk lying in his lap. The fabric had grown. He looked up and saw the moon through the temple window. She was shining her light on the cloth. And the more the moon shone, the bigger the cloth grew. The tailor smiled to himself. He took out his sharp scissors and his needle and thread, and he began to snip and stitch and sew. And just as the tailor had dreamed, he made a cloak for the moon, as light as the clouds, and as bright as the stars. High in the sky, the moon slipped on her new cloak. It was snug and soft and warm and wonderful. On winter nights, the moon still wears her mist white star bright cloak. And oh, how she glows. The tailor lay bathed in moonlight and felt glad inside. He had helped the moon to shine her brightest, just as we all do when we follow our dreams. So the next time you look at the moon, look and see if she's wearing her cloak. How the cock got his crown. Once long ago, when the world had just begun, there were six suns shining in the sky instead of just one. One spring, the rains refused to come, and the six brother suns parched the earth with their great heat. 
The farmers of every tribe watched in great dismay as the young green shoots they had sown with such effort baked brown in the white blaze. The wise ones of a village in the west gathered with their chieftain. The chieftain's forehead was creased with worry. Without food we shall surely die, he said. From within the crowd an old man said, the only help for it is to shoot the sons. The chieftain's forehead relaxed. That's it. He clapped his hands. We must gather from all the tribes the best archers. They must shoot down the sons. Strong archers from every tribe in the land traveled to the village in the west. Their clothes were of many colors and they spoke different tongues, but all were ready to rid the sky of the dangerous brother sons. Alas, though their bows were hefty and their arrows swift, in six times six they tried, pouring sweat and grunting with exertion, not one arrow reached even halfway to the sons. The archers looked at one another in great humility. In their many languages, they said, the six brothers are too far for our slender arrows. People drooped sadly in the terrible broil. How can we save ourselves? They wondered. Then suddenly, Howie, a sharp-eyed warrior from a faraway tribe, had an idea. Easing his hands so that he could speak to all the people, he beckoned them over to the edge of a pool of still water. There, moving ever so slightly on its surface, were reflected the six bowls of blinding white. How he pointed up with one hand to the heavenly suns and down with the other to the mirrored suns. Then, smiling hugely, he drew his hands together. Ah! How he seemed to be saying it that the suns and the sky and the water were the same. How he drew his bow, but instead of shooting up into the sky, he aimed straight down into the pool. His first arrow pierced the first sun, which disappeared into the bottom of the pool. Ah! He fired again, and the second sun disappeared. Then the third and the fourth and the fifth sun, the people whooped, how he was shooting down the suns. When the sixth sun saw what had happened to his brothers, he fled over the hill. The people fell at once into an exhausted sleep. They planned to wake the next day to sow again their crops. But alas, there was no next day. For the sixth sun, frightened and angry, had hidden himself deep in a cave and refused to come out. The night went on and on. The chieftain's forehead crinkled again with worry. The wise ones gathered. The crops will no more grow in constant darkness than they did in too much light, said the chieftain. We must send someone to coax the sun from its hiding place, said the old man. The people first sent the tiger to the sun's cave. The tiger roared and roared for the sun to come out. He batted with his paw at the cave's door. The sun was resolute. Go away, he shouted. I won't come out. The people then thought that the lowing of the cow might lure the sun. The cow begged gently outside the cave's entrance. The sun was still sulking. I won't come out, he yelled again. At last, the people sent a cock to crow outside the hiding place of the sun. The cock puffed up its feathers. He neither asked nor begged, but simply shouted exuberantly. The sun was enchanted. What a lovely sound, he said, and peeked out to see who could be making such music. The cock, just as pleased with his own music, strutted and crowed again and again. The sun liked cock's sound so much that he came all the way out of his cave. Sun and cock bowed to each other, and sun gave cock a present of a little red crown. Cock wears his red crown to this very day whenever he summons the sun, and even if the sun is slow in the cold time, remembering with sorrow the deaths of his brothers, he never fails to greet his feathered friend, nor to light the day for the farmers who are growing their crops for the people to eat. The Sun Cow and the Thief. Back at the beginning, the village was like a hinged box with many sides. A lonely man stood on the outside looking in. Through the cracks, he could see brightly colored crisscross lines everywhere. People walked to and fro along the lines, carving shapes and painting shimmering colors as they went. The man saw an order so neat and easy, it seemed he should have been able to slide right in the very blood in his body singing. But something was wrong with him, with the way things were. He could not get in. It was as if the village had no doors, only cracks. He could only look, never touch. He would always be on the outside looking in. Round the edges of the box, the sun cow walked. 
Round and round its perfect sides she walked, milking out her light in the day, filling the village box with color and warmth. At night, she chewed her cud, her black sides giving quiet warmth, but no light. The man stood between the sun cow and the village. The only warmth that the man could touch was the sun cow herself. Whenever those inside the village looked out, they saw only their sun cow, that lovely black heat, that night chewer, that day maker. They smacked their lips with the cream of it. They did not say, look at that nice man standing outside looking in. How silly that he stands alone at the edge when he could simply make a place for him and we could invite him, our carvings of shapes and colors. Come, sir, you are welcome. They didn't say that. They didn't even see him. And so the man waited for Sun Cow every day, waited for her to pass him by. He smelled her musky flanks, saw her soft eyes, and touched her velvet hot muzzle. By some mysterious pressure, her light honey milk poured out from her udder. The man could feel the pressure of his own sadness inside him. All at once, one day, the man decided to take the sun cow for himself. When all the pretty village people could not have her anymore, then finally everything might be fair. So he waited for her, not even bothering to hide. The village people could not see him after all, and she had walked sweetly near him nonchalant every day of his life. The day he stole Sun Cow, he simply tossed a noose over her head and pulled her away, away over the edge of the world, away from the box, away from all that can't get in, away alone to the edge. The lights and colors of the village plunged into darkness. Without Sun Cow's milk, there was only night. The people could not see. Babies cried, unfound and unfed by their mothers. No one knew when to wake up, when to work. All the order lay like unswept wood scraps in a dark room. The tidy lines were lumped and smudged. The colors disappeared. Where had their Sun Cow gone? What had become of her? They waited in sorrow and fear. The thief was having his own problems. At the beginning, he luxuriated in the warmth of Sun Cow's solidity, in her rhythmical grassy breath. But away from her circling walk around the little box world, away from her habits, no light came from her other. And because she would not let him milk her, it was night for him too. No one else had her. But now he didn't have her either. When the thief in desperation tried to set beneath her a pail and squeeze her teats, she kicked the pail away with such certain force that he feared that she would kick him too should he persist. She was only trying to save his life, of course, for just think what would happen to a single person who tried to milk the sun. The thief held his head in his hands for ever so long he sat, hoping for her light again, a longing for a sign that he might milk her. Finally, he knew he could not keep her anymore. He leaned against her for goodbye, for a final giving in to going back to the endless looking in and never having. And then he slipped the noose from its stake and from over her head and set the sun cow free. She did not return to her circling walk around the village. Instead, she leapt up high, joyously high, up over the moon. And now she walks not just around one village, but in a vast sky circle around all the villages, around the circle of the whole world, so that no one now need simply look in without being part, without being seen. Everywhere there are doors, carved intersections, lines crisscrossing that can be walked in and about, shivering and shining with color. Everywhere there is light. Now a poem from The Night Rainbow by Barbara Jester Esmondson. 
Above our heads, shimmering curtains move and part. The drapery gathers and falls. Over the forests of Meskwaki land, the light begins to flare and twist. Shining spirits shake their streaming hair. We whistle them down the sky. The dancers bend and leap and run. Their cloaks unfold and fold in ruby light. In dazzling moccasins, they whirl up and down the dark slopes of air. The pale fingers of their shawls hang in ruby light against the stars. And welcome back. And one of our last longer stories today is A Christmas Memory by Truman Capote. And Joe Wadsworth is going to lead us off and we have a few different readers for the story this evening. Enjoy. Imagine a morning in late November, a coming of winter morning more than 20 years ago. Consider the kitchen of a spreading old house in a country town. A great black stove is its main feature, but there is also a big round table and a fireplace with two rocking chairs placed in front of it. Just today, the fireplace commenced its seasonal roar. A woman with shorn white hair is standing at the kitchen sink. She is wearing tennis shoes and a shapeless gray sweater over a summery calico dress. She is small and sprightly, like a bantam hen. But due to a long youthful illness, her shoulders are pitifully hunched. Her face is remarkable. Not unlike Lincoln's, craggy like that, and tinted by sun and wind, but it is delicate too, finely boned, and her eyes are sherry colored and timid. Oh my, she exclaims, her breath smoking the window pane. It's fruitcake weather. The person to whom she is speaking is myself. I am seven, she is 60 something. We are cousins, very distant ones, and we have lived together, well, as long as I can remember. Other people inhabit the house, relatives. And though they have power over us and frequently make us cry, we are not on the whole too much aware of them. We are each other's best friend. She calls me Buddy, in memory of a boy who was formerly her best friend. The other Buddy died in the 1880s when she was still a child. She is still a child. I knew it before I got out of bed, she says, turning away from the window with a purposeful excitement in her eyes. The courthouse bell sounded so cold and clear and there were no birds singing. They've gone to warmer country. Yes, indeed. Oh, buddy, stop stuffing biscuit and fetch our buggy. Help me find my hat. We've 30 cakes to bake. It's always the same. A morning arrives in November and my friend, as though officially inaugurating the Christmas time of year that exhilarates her imagination and fuels the blaze of her heart, announces, it's fruitcake weather, fetch our buggy, help me find my hat. The hat is found, a straw cartwheel corsaged with velvet roses out of doors has faded. It once belonged to a more fashionable relative. Together we guide our buggy, a dilapidated baby carriage out to the garden and into a grove of pecan trees. The buggy is mine. Well, that is, it was bought for me when I was born. It's made of wicker, rather unraveled, and the wheels wobble like a drunkard's legs. But 
It is a faithful object. Spring times, we take it to the woods and fill it with flowers, herbs, wild fern for our porch pots. In summer, we pile it with picnic paraphernalia and sugarcane fishing poles and we roll it down to the edge of the creek. It has its winter uses too, as a truck for hauling firewood from the yard to the kitchen, as a warm bed for Queenie, our tough little orange and white rat terrier who has survived his temper and two rattlesnake bites. Queenie is trotting beside it now. Three hours later, we are back in the kitchen hauling a heaping buggy load of windfall pecans. Our backs hurt from gathering them. How hard they were to find. The main crop having been shaken off the trees and sold by the orchard's owners, who are not us. Among the concealing leaves, the frosted deceiving grass. Crackle! A cheery crunch scraps of miniature thunder sound as the shells collapse and the golden mound of sweet, oily ivory meat mounts in the milk glass bowl. Queenie begs to taste. And now and again, my friend sneaks her a mite, though insisting we deprive ourselves. We mustn't, buddy. If we start, we won't stop. And there's scarcely enough as there is for 30 cakes. The kitchen is growing dark. Dusk turns the window into a mirror. Our reflections mingle with the rising moon as we work by the fireside in the firelight. At last, when the moon is quite high, we toss the final howl into the fire and with joined sighs, watch it catch flame. The buggy is empty. The bowl is brim full. We eat our supper, cold biscuits, bacon, blackberry jam, and discuss tomorrow. Tomorrow, the kind of work I like best begins. Buying. Cherries and citron, ginger and vanilla and canned Hawaiian pineapple, rinds and raisins and walnuts and whiskey, and oh, so much flour, butter, so many eggs, spices, flavorings. Why, we don't need a pony to pull the buggy home. But before these purchases can be made, there is the question of money. Neither of us has any, except for skin flint sums persons in the house occasionally provide. A dime is considered very big money or what we earn ourselves from various activities, holding rummage sales, selling buckets of hand-picked blackberries, jars of homemade jam and apple jelly and peach preserves, rounding up flowers for funerals and weddings. Once we won 79th prize, $5 in a national football contest. Not that we know a full thing about football, it's just that we enter any contest we hear about. At the moment, our hopes are centered on the $50,000 grand prize being offered to name a new brand of coffee. We suggested AM. And after some hesitation, for my friend thought perhaps sacrilegious, the slogan, AM, Amen. To tell the truth, the only real, really profitable enterprise was the Fun and Freak Museum we conducted in a backyard woodshed two summers ago. The fun was a stereopticon with slide views of Washington and New York lent us by a relative who had been to those places. She was furious when she discovered why we borrowed it. The freak was a three-legged biddy chicken hatched by one of our own hens. Everybody hereabouts wanted to see that biddy. We charged grown-ups a nickel kids two cents. Took in a good $20 before the museum shut down due to the demise of the main attraction. But one way and another, we do each year accumulate Christmas savings, a fruitcake fund. These monies we keep hidden in an ancient bead purse under a loose board, under the floor, under a chamber pot, under my friend's bed. The purse is seldom removed from its safe place, except to make a deposit, or as happens every Saturday, a withdrawal. For on Saturdays, I am allowed 10 cents to go to the picture show. My friend has never been to a picture show. 
nor does she intend to. I'd rather hear you tell the story, buddy. That way I can imagine it more. Besides, a woman my age shouldn't squander their eyes. When the Lord comes, let me see him clear. In addition to never having seen a movie, she has never eaten in a restaurant, traveled more than five miles from home, received or sent a telegram, read anything except the funnies, funny papers and the Bible, worn cosmetics, cursed, wished someone harm, told a lie on purpose, let a hungry dog go hungry. Here are a few things that she has done, she does. Killed with a hoe, the biggest rattlesnake ever seen in this county, 16 rattles, dip snuff secretly, tame hummingbirds, I mean, you try it till they balance on her finger, tell ghost stories, we both believe in ghosts, so tingling they chill you in July, talk to herself, take walks in the rain, grow the prettiest japonicas in town, Know the recipe for every sort of old time Indian cure, including a magical wart, wart remover. Now, now with supper finished, we retire to the room in a faraway part of the house where my friend sleeps in a scrap quilt covered iron bed painted rose pink, her favorite color. Silently wallowing in the pleasures of conspiracy, we take the bead purse from its secret place and spill its contents on the scrap quilt. Dollar bills tightly rolled and green as may buds. Somber 50 cent pieces, heavy enough to weight a dead man's eyes. Lovely dimes, the liveliest coin, the one that really jingles. Nickels and quarters worn smooth as creek pebbles, we're mostly a hateful heap of bitter odored pennies. Last summer, others in the house contra contracted to pay us a penny for every 25 flies we killed. Oh, the carnage of August. The flies that flew to heaven. Yep, it was not work in which we took pride. And as far as, as, as we sit counting pennies, it is as though we were back tabulating dead flies. Neither of us has a head for figures. We count slowly, lose track, start again. According to her calculations, we have $12.73. According to mine, exactly $13. I do hope you're wrong, buddy. We can't mess around with 13. The cakes will fall or put somebody in the cemetery. Why, I wouldn't dream of getting out of bed on the 13th. This is true. She always spends 13ths in bed. So to be on the safe side, we subtract the penny and toss it out the window. Of the ingredients that go into our fruitcakes, whiskey is the most expensive, as well as the hardest to obtain. State laws forbid its sale. But everybody knows you can buy a bottle from Mr. Ha Ha Jones. And the next day, having completed one more prosaic shopping, we set out for Mr. Ha Ha's business address, a sinful, to quote public opinion, fish fry and dancing cafe down by the river. We've been there before and on the same errand, but in previous years, our dealings have been with Haha's -Ha wife, an iodine dark Indian woman with brassy peroxided hair and a dead tired disposition. Actually, we've never laid eyes on her husband, though we've heard he's an Indian too, a giant with razor scars across his cheeks. They call him Haha -Ha because he's so gloomy and man who never laughs. As we approach his cafe, a large log cabin festooned inside and out with chains of garish gay naked light bulbs and standing by the river's muddy edge over the shade, under the shade of river trees where moss drifts through the branches like gray mist. Our steps slow down. Even Queenie stops prancing and sticks close by People have been murdered in Haha's ha cafe, cut to pieces, hit on the head. There's a case coming up in court next month. Naturally, these going, goings on happen at night when the colored lights cast crazy patterns and the Victrola wails. In the daytime, Haha's ha is shabby and deserted. I knock at the door. Queenie barks. 
my friend calls, Mrs. Ha Ha, ma'am, anyone to home? Footsteps. The door opens. Our hearts overturn. It's Mr. Ha Ha Jones himself. And he is a giant. He does have scars. He doesn't smile. No, he glowers at us through Satan tilted eyes and demands to know what you want with Ha Ha. For a moment, we are too paralyzed to tell. Presently, my friend half finds her voice, a whispery voice at best. If you please, Mr. Ha, we'd like a quart of your finest whiskey. His eyes tilt more. Would you believe it? Ha Ha is smiling, laughing too. Which one of you is a drinking man? It's for making fruitcakes, Mr. Ha Ha, cooking. This sobers him, he frowns. That's no way to waste good whiskey. Nevertheless, he retreats into the shadowed cafe and seconds later appears carrying a bottle of daisy yellow unlabeled liquor. He demonstrates its sparkle in the sunlight and says, $2. We pay him with nickels and dimes and pennies. Suddenly, as he jangles the coins in his hand like a fistful of dice, his face softens. Tell you what, he proposes, pouring the money back into our bead purse. Just send me one of them fruit cakes instead. Well, my friend remarks on our way home, there's a lovely man. We'll put an extra cup of raisins in his cake. The black stove stoked with coal and firewood glows like a lighted pumpkin. Egg beaters whirl, spoons spin round in bowls of butter and sugar. Vanilla sweetens the air, ginger spices it. Melting, nose tingling odors saturate the kitchen, suffuse the house drift out to the world on puffs of chimney smoke. In four days, our work is done. 31 cakes, dampened with whiskey, bask on window sills and shelves. Who are they for? Friends, not necessarily neighbor friends. Indeed, the larger share is intended for persons we've met maybe once, perhaps not at all. People who've struck our fancy, like President Roosevelt, like the Reverend and Mrs. J.C. Lucy, Baptist missionaries to Borneo, who lectured here last winter, or the little knife grinder who comes through town twice a year, or Abner Packer, the driver of the six o'clock bus from Mobile, who exchanges waves with us every day as he passes in a dust cloud whoosh, or the young Wistons, a California couple whose car one afternoon broke down outside the house and who spent a pleasant afternoon chatting with us on the porch. Young Mr. Whiston snapped our picture, the only one we've ever had taken. Is it because my friend is shy with everyone except strangers that these strangers and mere acquaintances seem to us our trusted, our truest friends? I think yes. Also the scrapbooks we keep of thank yous on White House stationery, time to time communications from California and Borneo, the knife grinders, penny postcards make us feel connected to eventful worlds beyond the kitchen with its view of a sky that stops. Now a new December fig branch grates against the window. The kitchen is empty. The cakes are gone. Yesterday, we carted the last of them to the post office where the cost of stamps turned our purse inside out. We're broke. That rather depresses me. But my friend insists on celebrating with two inches of whiskey left in Haha's bottle. Queenie has a spoonful in a bowl of coffee she likes her coffee, coffee chicory flavored and strong. The rest we divide between a pair of jelly glasses. We're both quite awed at the prospect of drinking straight whiskey. The taste of it brings screwed up expressions and sour shudders. But by and by we begin to sing, the two of us singing different songs simultaneously. I don't know the words to mine, just come on along, come on along to the dark town strutters ball. But I can dance. That's what I meant to be, a tap dancer in the movies. My dancing shadow rollicks on the walls, our voices rock the china where we giggle as if unseen hands were tickling us. Queenie rolls on her back, her paws plow the air. Something like a grin stretches her black lips. Inside myself, I feel warm and sparky as those crumbling logs, carefree as the wind in the chimney. My friend waltzes around the stove, the hem of her poor calico skirt pinched between her fingers as though it were a party dress. 
Show me the way to go home, she sings, her tennis shoes squeaking on the floor. Show me the way to go home. Answer, two relatives, very angry, potent with eyes that scold, tongues that scald. Listen to what they have to say, the words tumbling together in a wrathful tune. A child of seven, whiskey on his breath. Are you out of your mind? Mm -hmm. Feeding a child of seven. Must be loony, road to ruination. Remember cousin Kate, Uncle Charlie, Uncle Charlie's brother-in-law? Shame, scandal, humiliation. Kneel, pray, beg the Lord. Queenie sneaks under the stove. My friend gazes at her shoes, her chin quivers. She lifts her skirt and blows her nose and runs to her room. Long after the town has gone to sleep and the house is silent, except for the chiming of clocks and the sputter of fading fires, she is weeping into a pillow already as wet as a widow's handkerchief. Don't cry, I say, sitting at the bottom of her bed and shivering despite my flannel nightgown that smells of last winter's cough syrup. Don't cry, I beg, teasing her toes, tickling her feet. You're too old for that. It's because, she hiccups, I am too old. Old and funny. Not funny, fun. More fun than anybody. Listen, if you don't stop crying, you'll be too tired tomorrow, and we won't be able to go cut a tree. She straightens up. Queenie jumps on the bed, where Queenie is not allowed to lick her cheeks. I know where we'll find real pretty trees, buddy. And Holly, too with berries as big as your eyes. It's way off in the woods, farther than we've ever been. Papa used to bring us Christmas trees from there, carry them on his shoulder. That's 50 years ago. Well, now I can't wait for morning. Morning. Frozen rime lusters the grass, the sun rounds an orange, and orange as hot weather moons balances on the horizon, burnishes the silvered winter woods, Wild turkey calls. A renegade hog grunts in the undergrowth. Soon, by the edge of knee-deep, rapid-running water, we have to abandon the buggy. Queenie wades the stream first, paddles across, barking complaints at the swiftness of the current, the pneumonia-making coldness of it. We follow, holding our shoes and equipment, a hatchet and a burlap sack, above our heads. A mile more of chastising thorns, burrs, and briars that catch at our clothes, of rusty pine needles brilliant with gaudy fungus and molted feathers. Here, there, a flash, a flutter, an ecstasy of shrillings remind us that not all the birds have flown south. Always the path unwinds through lemony sun pools and pitch black vine tunnels. Another creaked across, a disturbed armada of speckled trout frosts the water around us, and frogs the size of plates practice belly flops. Beaver workmen are building a dam. On the further shore, Queenie shakes herself and trembles. My friend shivers too, not with cold, but with enthusiasm. One of her hat's ragged roses sheds a petal as she lifts her head and inhales the pine-heavy air. We're almost there. Can you smell it, buddy, she says as though we were approaching an ocean. And indeed it is a kind of ocean, scented acres of holiday trees, prickly leafed holly, red berries shiny as Chinese bells, black crows swoop upon them screaming. Having stuffed our burlap sacks with enough greenery and crimson to garland a dozen windows, we set about choosing a tree. It should be, muses my friend, twice as tall as a boy so a boy can't steal the star. The one we pick is twice as tall as me, a brave, handsome brute that survives 30 hatchet strokes before it keels with a creaking, rending cry. Lugging it like a kill, we commence the long trek out. Every few yards, we abandon the struggle, sit down and pant. But we have the strength of triumphant huntsmen, that and the trees' virile, icy perfume revive us and goad us on. Many compliments accompany our sunset return along the red clay road to town, but my friend is sly and noncommittal when passers-by praise the treasure perched in the buggy 
What a fine tree, and where did it come from? Yonder ways, she murmurs vaguely. Once, a car stops, and the rich mill owner's lazy wife leans out and whines, Give you two bits cash for that old tree. Ordinarily, my friend is afraid of saying no. But on this occasion, she promptly shakes her head. Mm, we wouldn't take a dollar. Mill owner's wife persists. A dollar, my foot. Fifty cents, that's my last offer. Goodness, woman, you can get another. In answer, my friend gently reflects. I doubt it. There's never two of anything. Home. Queenie slumps by the fire and sleeps till tomorrow, snoring as loud as a human. A trunk in the attic contains a shoebox of ermine tails off the upper cape of a curious lady who once rented a room in the house. Coils of frazzled tinsel gone gold with age. One silver star, a brief robe of dilapidated, undoubtedly dangerous candy-like light bulbs. Excellent decorations as far as they go, which isn't far enough. My friend wants our tree to blaze like a Baptist window and to droop with weighty snows of ornaments. But we can't afford the made in Japan splendors at the five and dime. So we do what we've always done, sit for days at the kitchen table with scissors and crayons and stacks of colored paper. I make sketches and my friend cuts them out. Lots of cats, fish too, because they're easy to draw. Some apples, some watermelons, a few winged angels devised from saved up sheets of Hershey bar tin foil. We use safety pins to attach these creations to the tree. As a final touch, we sprinkle the branches with shredded cotton, picked in August for this purpose. My friend, surveying the effect, claps her hands together. Now, honest buddy, doesn't it look good enough to eat? Queenie tries to eat an angel. After weaving and ribboning holly wreaths for all the front windows, our next project is the fashioning of family gifts. Tie-dye scarves for the ladies, for the men, a home-brewed lemon and licorice and aspirin syrup to be taken at the first symptoms of a cold and after hunting. But when it comes for making each other's gifts, my friend and I separate to work secretly. I would like to buy her a pearl-handled knife, a radio, a whole pound of chocolate-covered cherries, we tasted some once and she always swears I could live on them, buddy. Lord, yes, I could. And that's not taking his name in vain. Instead, I am building her a kite. She would like to give me a bicycle. She said so on several million occasions. If only I could, buddy. It's bad enough in life to do without something you want, but confound it. What gets my goat is not being able to give somebody something you want them to have. One of these days I will, buddy. Locate you a bike. Don't ask how, steal it maybe. Instead, I'm fairly certain she is building me a kite. The same as last year and the year before. The year before that we exchanged slingshots. All of which is fine by me. For we are champion kite flyers who study the wind like sailors. My friend more accomplished than I can get a kite aloft when there isn't enough breeze to carry clouds. Christmas Eve afternoon, we scrape together a nickel and go to the butchers to buy Queenie's traditional gift, a good gnawable beef bone. The bone wrapped in funny paper is placed high in the tree near the silver star. Queenie knows it's there. She squats at the foot of the tree, staring up in a trance of greed. When bedtime arrives, she refuses to budge. Her excitement is equaled only by my own. I kick the covers and turn my pillow as though it were a scorching summer's night. Somewhere a rooster crows falsely for the sun is still on the other side of the world. Buddy, are you awake? It is my friend calling from her room, which is next to mine. And an instant later, she is sitting on my bed holding a candle. Well, I can't sleep a hoot, she declares. My mind's jumping like a jackrabbit. Buddy, do you think Mrs. Roosevelt will serve our cake, cake at dinner? We huddle in the bed and she squeezes my hand. I love you. Seems like your hand used to be so much smaller. I guess I hate to see you grow up. When you're grown up, will we still be friends? I say always. But I feel so bad, buddy. I wanted so bad to give you a bike. I tried to sell my cameo Papa gave me. Buddy, she hesitates as though embarrassed. I made you another kite. 
Then I confess that I made her one too, and we laugh. The candle burns, too short to hold. Out it goes, exposing the starlight. Stars spinning at the window like a visible caroling that slowly, slowly daybreak silences. Possibly we doze, but the beginnings of dawn splash us like cold water. We're up wide eyed and wondering while we wait for others to waken. Quite deliberately, my friend drops a kettle on the kitchen floor. I tap dance in front of closed wind doors. One by one, the household emerges, looking as though they'd like to kill us both. But it's Christmas, so they can't. First, a gorgeous breakfast, just everything you can imagine, from blackjacks and fried squirrel to hominy grits and honey in the comb, which puts everyone in good humor, except my friend and me. Frankly, we're so impatient to get at the presents, we can't eat a mouthful. Well, I'm disappointed. I mean, who wouldn't be? With socks, a Sunday school shirt, some handkerchiefs, a hand-me-down sweater, a year subscription to a religious magazine for children, the little shepherd. It makes me boil, it really does. My friend has a better haul. A sack of satsumas, that's her best present. She is proudest, however, of a white wool shawl knitted by my married sister. But she says her favorite gift is the kite I built her. And it is very beautiful though not as beautiful as the one she made me, which is blue and scattered with gold and green, good and green good conduct stars. Moreover, my name is painted on it, buddy. Buddy, the wind is blowing. The wind is blowing and nothing will do till we've run to a pasture below the house where Queenie has scooted to bury her bone and where a winter hence Queenie will be buried too. There, Plunging through the healthy waist high grass, we unreal our kites, feel them twitching at the string like sky fish as they swim into the wind. Satif satisfied, sun warmed, we sprawl in the grass and peel satsumas and watch our kites cavort. Soon I forget the socks and hand-me-down sweater. I'm as happy as if we'd already won the $50,000 grand prize in the coffee naming contest. My, how foolish I am, my friend cries, suddenly alert like a woman remembering too late she has biscuits in the oven. You know what I've always thought? She asks in a tone of discovery and not smiling at me, but a point beyond. I've always thought a body would have to be sick and dying before they saw the Lord. And I imagined that when he came to get it, it would be like looking at the Baptist window. Pretty as colored glass with the sun pouring through, such a shine you don't know it's getting dark. And it's been a comfort to think of that shine taking away all the spooky feeling. But I'll wager it never happens. I'll wager at the very end, a body realizes the Lord has already shown himself that things are as they are. Her hand circles in a gesture that gathers clouds and kites and grass and queenie pawing earth over her bone. Just what they've always seen was seeing him. As for me, I could leave the world with today in my eyes. This is our last Christmas together. Life separates us. Those who know best decide that I belong in a military school and so follows a miserable succession of bugle blowing prisons, grim reverie ridden summer camps. I have a new home too, but it doesn't count. Home is where my friend is, and there I never go. And there she remains, puttering around the kitchen, alone with Queenie, and alone. Buddy, dear, she writes in her wild, hard-to-read script. Yesterday, Jim Macy's horse kicked Queenie bad. Be thankful she didn't feel much. I wrapped her in a fine linen sheet and rode her in the buggy down to Simpson's pasture, where she can be with all of her bones. For a few Novembers, she continues to bake her fruit cake single-handed, not as many, but some. And of course, she always sends me the best of the batch. Also in every letter, she encloses a dime, wadded in toilet paper, see a picture show, and write me a story. But gradually in her letters, she tends to confuse me with her other friend, the buddy who died in the 1880s. More and more, 13ths are not the only day she stays in bed. 
A morning arrives in November, a leafless birdless coming of winter morning when she cannot rouse herself to exclaim, oh my, it's fruitcake weather. And when it happens, I know it. A message saying so merely confirms a piece of news some secret vein had already received, severing me from an irreplaceable part of myself letting it loose like a kite on a broken string. That is why walking across a school campus on this particular December morning, I keep searching the sky as if I expected to see, rather like hearts, a pair of kites hurrying toward heaven. Thank you for joining us tonight and we're going to finish off with this year light a candle for peace by lee westman this was written in december 21st 2001 and it comes from his book notebook i went out to buy a gift today but i did not find what i was looking for in fact i didn't even know what i was looking for all i found was a candle it had been that way lately. Material things have been no inspiration and stuff just seems like stuff. I know, I know, we're supposed to buy things. It's our patriotic duty. And if we don't buy things, then the terrorists win, etc., and, and so forth. But somehow it just doesn't seem meaningful to go out and trade my labor for fluffy sweaters and George Foreman fat fryers and binoculars and CD burners and slippers. It seems as if Christmas has come too quickly this year. It's been coming too quickly every year. Holidays are beginning to flutter past me like tinsel in a gale. Somehow though, this year feels like an important one. It feels like a good time to slow things down, step out of the wind and take refuge in the company of people who mean the most to us. After all, we saw what can happen. Anything can happen, anything at all. You could be stricken by a rare disease. You could be carried away by aliens. A plane could crash into your building. I've always wanted to take a few days off at Christmas and just go visiting as many people as I could. There are way too many old friends I haven't seen. I don't know why we lose touch. There aren't any good excuses. We have careers, but for most of us, we would bring more to our careers if we had good, strong friendships to help rekindle our spirits. We have kids to raise, but our kids' lives would be a lot richer if we exposed them to more of our friends. We have shopping to do. It is our patriotic duty, but who wouldn't trade a mall for an hour of conversation? So today, I rushed out to buy a gift at Arden Fair. I had been putting off the effort for weeks, dreading the crowded scene, the twinge I always get at the commercialization of a holy day. I was strolling in a bit of a daze and all the store windows were blurring together when I heard a voice call my name. I turned around and there was a dear old friend. We hugged and then looked at each other sheepishly. Has it really been a year since we talked? We caught up quickly and then had to go our separate ways, laughing again, sheepishly, at how long it would take before the guilt sets in for having once again broken our promises to keep in touch. As she walked away, this annual exercise, wasting time in shopping malls when I ought to be going from one friend's door to another, seemed even more pointless than usual. I walked and wondered what to do next. The only good gift I could think of were airline tickets so my family could get some adventure time together. The kids will be gone soon. Only two more Decembers remain before the older ones go to college. The younger will leave two years after that. It grieves me to think of them leaving so soon. I can't adapt. I still require them to leave carrots out on the lawn for Santa's reindeer on Christmas Eve. I still go out in the middle of the night and chew on the carrots so it'll look like the reindeer came. My daughters can hardly believe I do this, but they know I can't adapt. 
I didn't have the money today for a spontaneous gift like airline tickets. So I just kept walking the mall. Oh, I used to be spontaneous. I was telling my kids the other day about a time before they were born, a time when my wife and I found ourselves with eight unexpected house guests on a December night. Two friends had shown up with a Canadian guy and a Swedish guy they had just recently met. And I brought home a kid I'd met that day from Japan who spoke no English, but was riding his bike alone from the West Coast to the East Coast. Then came a knock on the door and we found three college students who were riding their bikes from the East Coast to the West Coast and had been given my name as a place where they might stay the night. Hearing me tell this story, my kids just stared as if a reindeer was crawling out of my mouth. They couldn't picture me being that easygoing. So I walked down the mall and soon I found myself in a little shop that sells candles. And that's when a line from a bit of old prose came floating into my head. I have no idea who wrote it, but I still remembered the lines. Every year at about this time, the world lights a candle to peace. It is a universal gesture, immune to politics. It pays tribute to narrow philosophy, materialistic or messianic. The candle, when ignited, does not detonate. It illuminates. It doesn't challenge the heavens in a thundering roar. It makes its plea in a steady flame, reflected in the eye of a wondering child or the squint of an elder who has seen it all. The candle graces the menorah as it fits the tree. It is at home in all the windows of the world. And it dawned on me what I needed to buy, a simple candle one that I could light for peace. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you to all of our readers. Elaine, come back on camera for a second. And sure. thank you to Webster's Bookstore for having us here this evening. Our pleasure, our pleasure. I wanted to remind all the people uh, watching this evening or whenever you're watching, um, you know, C.S. Lewis said, we read to know we are not alone. Uh, at Tempest, we love to share stories. Um, when you, uh, when you, when you share, share a story with someone, someone you're never you're alone. alone. So, so thank, thank you, you for joining us. It's been a pleasure. And we'll, we'll see you for more stories down the road, I'm sure. And, and so, so to pick, pick it up, up starting tomorrow night, December 11th, December 11th through January 6th, the next 26 days, we will have a new story, a set of poems, a song, all kinds of various things that celebrate the different holidays around the world. And tomorrow night, it is a Child's Christmas in Wales with the illustrious and wonderful John Vickers Jones at 7 p.m. Every night we'll drop a story and you can catch the series all through the holidays. Happy, Happy holidays, holidays, everyone, and thank, thank you. you. Happy, Happy holidays. holidays. Um.